In the last episode, we looked at how to build a multilayer perceptron and all of the computations involved in the forward pass. In this episode, we'll see how to actually train an MLP, which essentially means how to tweak the parameters, the weights and the biases, so that the network performs the task we want. To start with, let's look at how to prepare the training data. As we saw, MLPs can approximate almost any function and the tasks we want the network to perform can be thought of as functions. However, we often don't know the exact details of the function we're trying to mimic. This is because for real world tasks such as image and speech recognition, these functions are complex and cannot be simply defined with a known formula. In other words, we don't know the value of the function for every possible data point. So the first step to training a network is to collect a set of samples for which we know the values of the function. For every piece of data, like an image or speech recording, we collect its corresponding target label or output. Think of it as pairing an image with its category or a speech clip with its transcription. These paired samples become the training data for our MLP to learn from. Let's take a closer look at the target outputs for our data set. For regression tasks, things are relatively straightforward. Regression involves predicting continuous values, so the output of our data set would typically be the expected numerical values themselves. For example, if we're building a model to predict house prices based on various features, the target outputs would be the actual prices of the houses in the training data. Classification tasks, on the other hand, require a different approach. Here, we are aiming to categorize data into distinct classes. However, neural networks fundamentally operate on numbers, not textual or categorical labels. So simply having labels like apple, banana, cherry wouldn't suffice. Instead, the textual labels need to be converted into a format that the network can work with. This is where one hot encoding comes into play. Using a fruit example, instead of the textual labels, we'd represent each fruit as a binary vector of zeros and ones. In this format, each position in the vector corresponds to a specific fruit category. A1 denotes the presence of that category for a given data point, while zero indicates its absence. By converting our labels into this numeric format, we ensure that our network can effectively learn to classify data points into the correct categories. Once we've prepared our data sets, we often also want to perform an additional step, normalization. This refers to the process of standardizing the range and scale of the data points in our data set. Imagine a dataset that contains age, ranging from 0 to 100, and income, possibly ranging from thousands to millions. These two features have vastly different scales. If we feed these directly into our network, the model might give undue importance to income just because its values are larger, even if age might be more relevant for the prediction. By normalizing, we are essentially transforming our data so that all input features, regardless of their original scale, have a consistent range, often between 0 and 1, or a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. This ensures that no particular feature dominates the learning process solely due to its larger magnitude. During training, we typically partition our dataset into distinct subsets, each serving a specific purpose in the life cycle of model development and evaluation. As the name suggests, the training set is used to train our model. This is the data on which our neural network algorithm practices and adjusts its weights. The validation set plays an important role in the model building process. While the training set helps the model learn, the validation set assists in tuning model parameters and preventing overfitting that we'll cover later. It provides a platform to validate the model's performance during training and helps in making decisions like when to stop training 
or which model architecture is the most promising. Once our model is trained and validated, we need a final measure of its performance, and that's where the testing set comes in. The dataset provides an unbiased evaluation of the model's performance on unseen data, giving us an idea of how our model might perform in real-world scenarios. All right, we have the data ready and we pass it through our network, which we have initialized with random weights. Now, to train the network, we first need to establish how off our network's predictions are from the actual values. And we do this with the loss function. The loss function quantifies the divergence between the network's output and the target output, acting as a guide for how well our network's performing. Choosing the right loss function is instrumental in training a successful model, and the choice often hinges on the nature of the problem at hand. When we are predicting continuous values, such as the price of a house, this is simple. We can actually calculate the error as the mean difference between the predicted value and the true values. This is called mean absolute error, or L1. We could also use the mean squared error, or L2, which simply squares these differences, which tends to amplify large errors and is more sensitive to outliers. Classification is a bit more complex. Here we are assigning data points to specific categories, and our model's output is essentially a probability distribution across these categories. For instance, in classifying an image as a cat or a dog, the model might output probabilities like 90% cat and 10% dog. To measure the difference between the predicted probabilities and the actual labels, we typically use the cross-entropy loss function. We won't delve into the mathematical details here, but for reference, keep in mind that cross-entropy is related to KL divergence, which measures the difference between two probability distributions. So far, we have a set of training data with inputs and the desired outputs or labels, and the loss function tells us how off our network's predictions are from the actual labels. So now we can define the problem of training a network in terms of minimizing the loss function. A key point here is that the loss is essentially a function of the network's parameters, weights and biases. So training a network can be seen as trying to minimize the loss by adjusting these parameters. In other words, we want to find values for the weights and biases that make the loss small, reducing the error of our network and increasing its performance. But since both the network and its loss are complex functions, finding values that minimize the loss is not straightforward. A naive approach could be to randomly try different weights and hope to get lucky and stumble on a set of weights that minimizes the loss effectively. However, this is like finding a needle in a high stack and won't work in practice for real large networks. Instead, we apply an optimization approach called gradient descent. Imagine you are on a hilly terrain and your objective is to reach the lowest point. Instead of wandering aimlessly, you'd probably feel the ground slope with your feet and move downwards. This slope is analogous to the gradient or derivative. The derivative tells us the influence of a weight on the loss. Specifically, the derivative of the loss with respect to a weight tells us how much a minute increment to that weight will affect the loss. If we add a small amount to this weight, will the loss grow or shrink? By how much? The intuition is that once we know the derivative of a weight, we are in a position to update the value of the weight in the opposite direction of the derivative, which will make the loss go down. This is the key idea of gradient descent. To compute the derivative of the loss with respect to each weight, we need to build a computation graph, keeping track of all of the operations that we performed in the forward pass. Then, in the so-called backward pass, we can apply calculus chain rule to compute the derivatives of the loss with respect to each parameter. All of these derivatives together form the gradient, which is a vector that points in the direction in which the loss function increases the most. 
Now that we understand what the gradient of the loss means, we can take a look at a typical training loop for a neural network using gradient descent.